Hello, welcome to Docker Technology for DevOps run Docker Containers course. This course will cover the fundamentals of Docker Technology and teach you everything you need to know about developing and deploying modern applications with Docker software. Tons of companies are using Docker containers in production. Today, you have access to the same virtualization technology right on your desktop. Together, we will walk through how to develop and deploy a multi server application with Docker technology. We will see how to automate the entire Docker workflow with Docker Compose. You will learn how to deploy our applications across multiple services in the cloud within seconds by using Docker Swarm and much, much more. During the past two years, I've been leading my team to containerize our old monolithic application with a microservice approach. My company has gained massive benefits running Docker containers in production. And in this course, I'm going to share with you my years of knowledge and best practices of working with Docker applications in the real field. This course is very hands-on. I have put lots of effort to provide you with not only the theory, but also real-life examples of developing Docker applications that you can try out on your own laptop. I have uploaded all the source code to GitHub, and you will be able to follow along with your Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. At the end of this course, you are not only going to gain working level knowledge of Docker software, but also you will learn useful DevOps skills, such as setting up continuous integration pipelines. Nowadays, DevOps engineers are in great demand in the IT industry. Companies are looking for developers who can develop and deploy the applications. The average salary of a DevOps engineer is about one $140,000 per year in Silicon Valley area, which is 20% higher than the salary of a software engineer. Are you ready to take your DevOps skills and career to the next level? Take this course now. At the end of this course, I'm confident that you will gain in-depth knowledge about Docker technology and general DevOps skills to help your company or your own project to apply the right Docker workflow and continuously deliver better software. We'll go from zero to Docker Hero in four hours. Feel free to take a look at the course description and preview any of the lectures. And Hello, welcome to Docker Technology for DevOps run Docker Containers course. This introduction lecture, we'll see what this course covers and what you will learn from this course. In the first section, we'll develop a conceptual understanding of virtualization technologies hypervisors, and Linux containers. Then we'll see how Docker fits into the overall virtualization technology ecosystem. Then we'll get to know Docker server and client architecture. Next, we'll learn how to install Docker on your local computer. No matter whether you're using Windows, Mac, or Linux, you'll be able to follow along. Develop our understanding of some of the most important Docker terminologies, such as containers, images, Docker registries, and repositories. And we'll try out our first Docker workflow where we'll pull an image from Docker, create and run a container from the image. Then we'll take a close look at some of the commands to work with Docker containers such as Docker PS and Docker Inspect, etc. In section two, we'll start by introducing an important Docker concept, image layers. Then we'll learn how to create our first Docker image using Docker commit command. Next, we'll look at a more professional Docker workflow, which is to use Docker file to build Docker images, which we can run as containers. Then we'll deep dive into several important Docker file instructions, such as run, command, copy, etc. And once we create our own image, we'll demo pushing our image to Docker. Then we can pull that image from online repository to run on another environment such as staging or production. In section 3, we'll apply the knowledge we have learned so far to containerize a simple Hello World web application. Next, to extend our Hello World web application to a key value lookup service by incorporating Redis Docker image. You'll find out how effective it is to use Docker to build up applications with a microservice approach. Then we see how to use containers linkings, which allow 
cleaners to discover each other and securely transfer information about one container to another. And we'll take a close look at how container linking works behind the scene. We'll learn how to automate our current Docker workflow with Docker Compose. Then we'll cover more details of Docker Compose workflow, such as Docker Compose build and Docker Compose PS, etc. In section 4, we're going to talk about Docker Container Networking. We'll cover different types of networks used in Docker World and how to create your own user-defined networks. In Section 5, we'll create some unit tests to test our application and run those tests inside the Docker Container. Next, we'll extend our Docker workflow set up the GitHub account and CircleCI account to create a continuous integration line in the cloud so that any changes pushed to our GitHub repository will trigger a build on CircleCI. After the test is green, the Docker image will be automatically pushed to Docker Hub. We'll start by learning some of the concerns about running Docker containers in production. Then we'll see how to deploy our application to production server running in the DigitalOcean cloud. Then we'll learn how to use Docker Swarm scale Docker workflow and deploy our Docker web application across multiple hosts in the cloud. At the end of this course, I'm confident that you will gain in-depth knowledge about Docker technology and general DevOps skills to help your company or your own project apply the right Docker workflow and continuously deliver better software. You will go from zero to Docker Hero Technically, Docker is one implementation of the container-based virtualization technologies. Let's take a look at how virtualization technology has evolved over time. In the pre-virtualization days, we're using big server racks. Underneath, we have the physical server. We install the desired operating system on it. Then we run the application on top of the operating system and each physical machine would only run one application. So what was the problem with this model? First of all, we have to purchase a physical machine in order to deploy each application. And those commercial servers can be very expensive. And we might end up only using a fraction of the CPU or a memory of the machine. The rest of the resources are simply wasted, but you have to pay for the whole hardware upfront. Secondly, deployment time is often slow. The process of purchasing and configuring new physical servers can take ages, especially for big organizations. Thirdly, it will be painful to migrate our applications to servers from different vendor. Let's say, we install our application on an IBM server. It would take us lots of effort to migrate to all servers. A significant amount of configuration change and manual intervention is required. The rescue is the hypervisor-based virtualization technology. Let's take a look at this virtualization model. Underneath, we have the physical server. Then we install the desired operating system. On top of the operating system, a hypervisor layer is introduced, which allows us to install multiple virtual machines on a single physical machine. Each VM can have a different operating system. For example, we can have Ubuntu installed on one VM and Debian on another. In this way, we can run multiple operating systems on a single physical machine, and each operating system can run a different application. This traditional model of virtualization, which is being referenced as the hypervisor-based virtualization. Some of the popular hypervisor providers are VMware and VirtualBox. In the early stage, users would deploy VMs on their own physical but nowadays, more and more companies have been shifted to deploy VMs in the cloud providers such as AWS and Microsoft Azure, which means we don't even have to just physical machines up front. There are some huge benefits with this model. First of all, it is more cost effective. Each physical machine is divided in multiple VMs and each one only uses its own CPU, memory, and storage resources. We pay only for the compute power, storage, and other resources you use. No upfront commitments, 
which is a typical pay as you go model. Secondly, it's to scale. With VMs deployed in the cloud environment, if you want more instances of application, we don't need to go through the long process of ordering and configuring new physical servers. We can simply click the mouse and deploy more VMs in the cloud. The time to scale our application can be reduced from weeks to just minutes. This results in a dramatic increase in agility for the organization. This hypervisor-based virtualization model has obvious advantage over the one application on one server model, but it still has some limitations. First of all, each machine still needs to have an operating system installed. This is an entire guest operating system with its own memory management, device drivers, daemons, etc. When we're talking about a Linux operating system, we're talking about a kernel. For example, here we have three hosts operating systems and three kernels. Even though they can be three different kernels, we're still replicating a lot of the core functionality of Linux. In this traditional hypervisor-based virtualization model, we have to have an entire operating system there simply to run our application, which is still not inefficient. Secondly, application probability is not guaranteed. Even though some progress has been achieved in getting virtual machines to run across different types supervisors, there is still a lot of work to be done there. VM portability is still at an early stage. Finally, the container-based virtualization technology comes out. Docker is one implementation of the container-based virtualization technologies. Let's look at the diagram here. Underneath, we have our server, and this can be either a physical machine or a virtual machine. Then we install our operating system on the server. On top of the OS, we install a container engine, which allows us to run multiple instances. Each guest instance is called a container. Within each container, we install the application and all the libraries that application depends on. The key to understand the difference between the hypervisor-based virtualization model and the container-based virtualization model is the replication of the kernels. In the traditional model, each application is running in its own copy of the kernel and the virtualization happens at the hardware level. In the new model, we have only one kernel, which will supply different binaries and runtime to the applications running in isolated containers. So the container will share the base runtime kernel, which is the container engine. For the new model, the virtualization happens at the operating system level. Containers share the host's OS, so this is much more efficient and lighted. You might want to ask, what do we gain by running those applications in different containers? Why can't we just run all applications in a single VM? And this comes through the nature of isolation. As you know, most applications depend on various third-party libraries. Let's say we want to run two Java replications with two different JREs. This is going to be quite challenging if you want to run those two applications in the same VM without introducing any conflicts. By leveraging containers, we can easily isolate the two runtime environments. Let's say application A requires JRE8. Then we just install JRE8 in the first container and run application A in the first container. For container B, it requires JRE7. Just install JRE7 only for second container and run application B inside the second container. In this way, we have two containers on the same machine, running two different applications, each with a different JRE version. This is what we call runtime isolation. Comparing to hypervisor-based virtualization, container-based virtualization has some obvious benefits. Firstly, it's more cost-effective. Container-based virtualization does not create an entire virtual operating system. Instead, only the required components are packed up inside the container with the application. Containers consume less CPU, RAM, and storage space than VMs. That means we can have more containers running on one physical machine than VMs. Secondly, faster deployment speed. 
Containers house the minimal requirements for running the application, which can speed up as fast as a process. A container can be several times faster to boost than a VM. Thirdly, great portability. Because containers are essentially independent self-sufficient application bundles, they can be run across machines without compatibility issues. That's it for this lecture. I'll see you later. into a small key value lookup web app. We'll start with implementing this key value lookup web app like this is the front end of the application. Here we can put Arabic number one and English number one. Let's save Arabic number and English number two as another key value. After the two key value, then look up the value with a key. Let's type Arabic number one. Code. See? The which would not look up Arabic number two. Let's see how this app is ended. I have already sorted hold of this application as VPU. You can just repository it downloaded and run git stash to stash any changes you made in your working directory. So that we have in directory and git checkout v0.2. Repository. Here I'm using you're free to use your favorites in the directory structure. You see, we have added a new HTML. This out of the web page you saw at the beginning of this lecture. Now, look you through of this application so that you have a rough idea about how this works. Let's take a look at the index.html file. This file defines the skeleton of the web page you just saw. It defines two input text. Fields. The first one is linked with variable key. The second one is variable. Those two variables are both defined in the controller, which is the app dot. It displays two seven buttons. One is to save the key value. The other one is to load the value of the key. Let's move on. And take a look at this app dot pi file. Here we are using. I in direct to store all the key value pairs in memory and initialize fiction entry. The second part of this called register of view function slash for both post and get HTTP methods. If page, this is going to be a get request to the server. If we click the save or load button, the browser will send a post request to the server. The view function only handles get method. So we need to specify both post and get methods here, so that the view function can hold both. Here we assign the default value, which is none, so that if we first load the web page, the app will delay. If the user specifies the key in the form, we then override the key variable. Next, if the use button, go and save the key value pair in our v memory dictionary. Then, we keep the dictionary to get the key value pair and pass it to the template to write the ML page. Those are all the changes we made in the controller though. The Docker file says as before, nothing. In then, what we do here is the Docker and tag it with these. Now it's time to spin up the container. Just issue the docker run command to start up the container. Let's wait and refresh the page. Our service is up running. This simple app is implemented as a single service. In the second half of this lab, we'll be looking into how we can service a docker image. Redis is an empty address. Store, open the base, cache, and replicate of on disk persistence. It's widely used in lots of people, such as Twitter timelines or book newsfeed. Let's see how we can integrate Redis into our key value lookup service. Since our application is written in Python, 
we'll need a Python Redis client so that our application can interact with the Redis server. You can find this Redis Python client web page by googling Redis Python client. As you see, the Redis API is very simple. It has a get API to look up the value with a key and a set API to save the key value pair in and to start with updating the app.py file to use the Redis. First, we need to import the Redis client module. Then we can just copy the Redis client initialization code from the Redis Python client web page. This would extract the client object for us. Note that this host parameter here specifies the server which the Redis connect to because we'll be in the Redis separate container. Here, we we'll just put the container name Redis. Here, I would show you how we can the Redis container with our Python server container initial value into the Redis. We also need to replace Python with the Redis API. Just update the code about saving the key pair at API. And also up here. By default, this would have a byte string which has a character B prefix. We'll need to decode the BF8 decoder. Don't forget to update this Python dictionary lookup code with Redis API as well. We're done with updating this controller file. Let's continue to update the Docker. We are using the Redis client in our Python code, so we need to ask Docker to install the Redis client package for us. Just type Redis and install the latest version, which is 0.5. Now we're done with the code modification. We'll see how we start Python apt container and the Redis container and how we can link them together. I'll see you later. Hello and welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the network. This network does not have any access to the outside world. The non-network adds a container to a container-specific network stack. That container lacks a container interface, so it's totally isolated. This kind of container is called closed container. Let's see it in action. In order to create a closed container, we can use the dash dash net none option in the docker run command. Here we do docker run dash dash net none busybox sleep 1000. This should start up a closed container in the none network from the busybox image. Sleep 1000 should keep the container in running state. Now let's log into the container and verify that this is indeed an isolated container. We copy the container ID first. 
do docker exec dash it. Paste the container ID and do slash bin dash ash. In case you don't know ash, ash is a very light Unix shell. Busybox is a tiny Linux distribution which comes with ash instead of bash shell. Now we're logged inside the container. To verify we're disconnected from the outside world, we can ping Google Public DNS, which is 8.8.8.8. .8 if we ping this IP from our host machine, as you see, there is no problem to reach Google Public DNS. If we ping this IP from the closed container, the IP is unreachable. This container is isolated from the outside world. Now we run if config command inside the container to list all the network interfaces of the container. As you see, there is only one network interface. This is a special type of interface called loopback interface. It is not connected to any networks and is assigned a special I address 127.0.0.1. It is mainly used by internal applications on the local host machine to communicate with each other. The biggest benefit of this isolated network model is that it provides the maximum level of network protection because the connections cannot be reached from outside the host. However, this network model won't be a good choice if network or internet connection is required. For example, if the application requires making HTTP requests to the outside world, this isolated network is well where the container requires the maximum level of network security and network access is not necessary. That's it for this lecture. I In this lecture, we'll see how we can write some unit tests for our application and run those tests inside a container. These unit tests should test some basic functionality of our Docker app code with no reliance on external services. Ideally, all tests, in particular unit tests, should run as quickly as possible so the developers can iterate much faster without being blocked by waiting for the test's results. Docker containers can be spin up in seconds and can create a clean and isolated environment, which is a great tool to run unit tests with. We'll be using a Python unit test framework called Unit Test to write unit tests. Here are some examples of the unit tests. Since writing unit tests is not the main focus of this course, I've already written down the test cases and uploaded to GitHub. You can download the source code by running git stash and git checkout v0.5. Let me quickly walk you through the unit test file. Just open the current directory and then open the test.py file. This is a very simple test file with two test cases and a setup method. This setup method will run before each test case and it initializes a test version of our Docker app. The first test case calls the slash URL with a key value pair and sets the summit value to save. This basically tests the behavior when we click the save button on the front end and verifies that the application returns a 200 status code and displays the key value pair submitted. The second test case calls the slash URL as well with a key value pair and sets the summit value to save which is exactly the same as the first test case. Then it calls the URL slash again with the same key and set the summit value to load. This is a quite simple test file, but how can we run this test suit in a container? We first build all the containers. There is a new docker compose command for us to learn. Docker compose run. Docker compose run will run a one-time command against a service inside a container. Here we can do docker compose run, then type the service name which is docker app. The command we want to run here is pytest.py which will run our test suit. The default command defined in the Docker file for the Docker app service is pythonapp.py, which runs our app. 
But now we are overriding the default command so that we can run our test file instead. Just hit enter. See, all the tests passed. In our case, we have incorporated the test for our application into our Docker app image. In this way, a single image is used through running at different environments. Great reality of our tests. The downside of this approach. Is that in the size of the image? In general, if your test files are that large, it's recommended to include the tests in the image for the sake of simplicity and reliability. That's it for this lecture. I hope you've enjoyed it. Hello and welcome back. We'll be registering a DigitalOcean account. So that we can use it to deploy our app on DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is a cloud infrastructure provider that can easily provisions virtual servers for you. It is similar to AWS EC2, but it's much simpler to work with. Now we're at the DigitalOcean website. Then type in your email address and password to register for an account. After clicking Create Account. DigitalOcean will send a confirmation email to you. Just log in into your email account and click the confirmation link. After you have verified the email, you can refresh this welcome page or re-log in into DigitalOcean account. Then you should see this Get Started button under the Update billing and becomes clickable. Then click the button to update your billing information. DigitalOcean requires you to provide your credit card or PayPal account information before you can use their service. Because we're going to redeem a free DigitalOcean coupon, which should be enough for us to deploy the smallest VM, so that DigitalOcean won't take any money from your credit card account. But if you would like to provide DigitalOcean your PayPal account instead of credit card, DigitalOcean would pre-charge you five dollars, which will be used as DigitalOcean credit. After we have updated the billing information, let's find a free DigitalOcean coupon code. Here we Google DigitalOcean promotion. There are plenty of available coupons here. Just click the first entry, then click Show Code. See, it gives you the Droplet 10 coupon code. Copy it to the clipboard. And go back to the DigitalOcean account and click Billings. Scroll down the page and paste the coupon code in the promotion code text box and hit Enter to redeem the coupon. See, the coupon has been redeemed successfully. But we have enough credit in our account to deploy a droplet, which is basically a DigitalOcean VM. In order to access DigitalOcean account through its API to provision a VM. We need to generate a personal access token. Personal access tokens function like ordinary OAuth access tokens, which can be used to allow us to access the resources on our DigitalOcean account without typing password. Here we click API, new tokens, then give the token a new name. Just type Docker app. Click generate token. See the token is generated. Click Copy to Clipboard, and then save this token to a file or any other places. Wherever is easy for you to retrieval, because we'll be using this token later to provision a VM to DigitalOcean.